I'm going to go over a wide range of things, and I think everyone will find something to disagree with, with things I say. I want to start out by saying I'm a materialist reductionist. So as I talk, some people might get a little worried that I'm going off, you know, like Chalmers or something, and, uh, uh, but I'm not. I'm, I'm really a, a material reductionist, a materialistic reductionist. But I'm worried that the crack cocaine of Moore's law, which has just given us more and more computation, has lulled us into thinking that's, that's all there is. Um, you know, when you look at the, the, the uh, Klaus Pierce's introduction to these Macy conferences, he says, uh, the common precondition of the three foundational concepts of cybernetics, switching uh, Boolean algebra, information theory, and feedback is digitality. Um, and so they go straight into digitality in, in, in this, this conference. Uh, he says, we considered Turing's universal machine as a model for brains employing Pitts and McCulloch's calculus for activity in neural nets. And anyone who's looked at the Pitts and McCulloch papers, it's a very primitive view of, of, of what is happening in neurons. Um, but they adopted Turing's universal machine. Now, how did Turing come up with Turing computation? He, in, in his 1936 paper, he talks about a human computer. Interestingly, he uses the male pronoun, whereas actually most of them were, were women. But a human computer with a piece of paper writing things down and following rules. And that was his model of computation, which we have come to accept. In the, um, you know, we're, we're talking about cybernetics, but in AI, in, in John McCarthy's 1955 um, proposal for the 1956 AI workshop at Dartmouth, the very first paragraph, um, uh, well, actually, actually, the first sentence is, we propose a study of artificial intelligence. He never defines artificial intelligence beyond that first sentence. That's the first place it's ever been used. But the second sentence is, the study is to proceed on the basis of the conjecture that every aspect of learning or any other feature of intelligence can, in principle, be so precisely described that a machine can be made to stim simulate it. And I think, as a materialistic reductionist, I sort of agree with that. The second paragraph is if a machine can do a job, then an automatic calculator can be programmed to simulate the machine. That's sort of a jump from any sort of machine to an automatic calculator. And we've all, that's sort of in, in the air. That's what we all sort of think. And neuroscience uses computation as a metaphor. And I question whether that's really the right set of metaphors. Um, you know, we know computation is not enough for everything. Classical computation cannot handle quantum uh, information processing. I think, Seth, is that okay with Apparently, well, apparently it can't. I agree. It can't. Well, no, it, sure it can. It's, just it's expensive. Yeah. Well, so it's a very different sort of thing. Uh, uh, no, that's not clear. It's not. Uh, it's not. <laughs> apparently it can't do it efficiently. Yeah. Okay. That's a different issue. But is it the right meta? It's then is it the right metaphor That's to think completely. about quantum mechanics as as classical computation? What's that? So the question then is, my point is, I don't think that we think that uh, compu classical computation is the right mechanism to think about quantum mechanics. There are other metaphors. The, the formalism of quantum mechanics, like the formalism yes. of current classical mechanics, is about real numbers. It's not so much the way computation Yeah. So <laughs> metaphors we live by. We, you know, Lakoff and Johnson, the old, uh, the, uh, who, who's familiar with Lakoff and Johnson's arguments? Uh, so Lakoff and Johnson talk about how we think in, in metaphors, and the metaphors are based in the, the physical world we operate in. Um, and that's how we think and reason. And so I think we, that in computation, Turing's computation, we use metaphors of place, and state and change of state at place. And that's the way we think about computation. There's these little places that we put stuff in and we move it around. Um, and that's our, our version of computation. I, I, I went back to Marvin Minsky's book, Computation, Finite and Infinite Machines. I, I'm sure, Danny, you know that book. It's just a beautiful, beautiful. It was when Marvin was at his peak mathematical powers. But right in, this, in, in, in the introduction, when he's describing what computation is, he said it's, a, you know, it's something that a, a, a machine with a finite number of simple parts can do. And that's not all that physics is. Physics is something more complex than that. So if we're 
pushing things into that information metaphor, are we, are we missing things? The Mathematica website says, the church Turing thesis, you probably wrote this, the church Turing thesis says that any real world computation can be translated into an equivalent computation involving a Turing machine. Certainly that's the church. Well, it's on your website. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so, you know, there's a jump there that any real world computation, what is, what is real world computation can be translated into? What, the, the real world phenomena, is that, what, what is that translation? Um, and, you know, we, we, using this, you know, these metaphors we think, think, think by, not only is it place, but it's sort of a, a, a countable world, countable, in the infinite, the infinite precision is not, is not there. Um, it, it fails in, 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 in quantum mechanics, et, et cetera. Um, so here, I'm going to give you some examples of where I think computation is not a, a good metaphor at all yeah, uh, for, for thinking about things. Um, I'm going to start with uh, polyclad flatworms. If you've ever been diving on a, um, uh, a, a coral reef, you've seen polyclad flatworms. They're little tiny frilly creatures around the edge. They sort of, you know, wander over the, the coral. Uh, they've got 2,000 neurons. They're very, very simple. Um, and uh, they can learn a little bit, but not much. So in the late 50s, early 60s, people started to do experiments to they did brain transplants between these polyclad flatworms to see if this one learned something. If they move the brain over, will the other one know the stuff? But I suspect a grad student made a mistake one day because suddenly there's a whole literature about what if you put the brain in the wrong way in the, in the other one. Um, now, these, these flatworms, they're, they're pretty primitive. They've got a, an eye spot. They've got a sort of feeding thing where their little frilly stuff that they use to walk with is also used to push the food into their, into their feeding hole. Um, and not, not much else. Um, but their brain has this, is 2,000 neurons, and it's at one end of, the, one end of their body, but there's this four set of ganglia going down the body, four parallel ganglia going down the body. So if you cut out the brain, you sort of cross a cut, a cut across these four, and you plop it into the other animal. By the way, when the, when the creature doesn't have the brain, it continues to live. It's really bad at feeding. It can't ride itself. It's bad at walking. But if it's in a really nutrient-rich environment, it continues to live without its brain. But when you plop it into the other one, if you put it in at 90 degrees angle, nothing good ever happens because the connections, the connectors are in the wrong place. But if you put it in backwards, well, the creatures sort of walk backwards for a while and then they get better at walking and adapt. But there's actually three ways you can put it in. You can put it in backwards, put it in backwards and flipped, or you can put it in just flipped. And if you study across the, the different the different uh, versions of that, you see different behaviors come back at different speeds, some behaviors never come back. But that's very different thinking about that as a computational thing to me, it seems. It seems that's a developmental thing. It's, it's how, it's, it's the, um, uh, you know, when, when we're going from a genome to uh, the, the creature, a lot of it is building and developing which is harder to think about computationally. That's clearly, I think, what's going on here. So maybe computation isn't the right meta principal metaphor to be thinking about in explaining this. It's some sort of adaptation. And our computation is not locally adaptive. Our computation is only globally adaptive. But this is an adaptation at every local level. And I overheard you guys talking about genetic algorithms and how understanding the probabilities and understanding which way things go. It's, it's sort of hard to think about it in a purely computational term. You need other metaphors. Here's another example. Um, where did, where did uh, neurons come from? Um, if you go back to very primitive creatures, there was electrical transmission across surfaces of cells, and then some things managed to transmit internally in the axons. If you look at jellyfish, Sometimes they have totally separate um, neural networks 
of different sorts of neurons, but completely separate networks for different behaviors. So, for instance, one of the things that neurons make work out well for jellyfish is how to synchronize their swimming with all the little things happening at the same time. They have a central clock generator. The, the signal gets distributed on the neurons, but there's different transmission times from the central clock to the different parts of the, the creature. So how do they handle that? Well, different species handle it different ways. Uh, some use very fast propagation, amazingly fast propagation. Others, um, they, because the spikes attenuate as they go a certain distance, there's a latency w where they get to which is inversely proportional to the signal strength. So the weaker the signal strength, the quicker you operate. And that's how the whole thing synchronizes. So is information processing the right metaphor there, or is control theory and, and uh, uh, resonance and synchronization the right metaphor? I think we need different metaphors at different times rather than just computation. And physical intuition um, that we probably have as we think about computation has served physicists well until you get to the quantum world. And when you get to the quantum world, that physical intuition about stuff and place gets in the way. You, you know, there's a few books out right now um, trying to explain quantum mechanics. There's one by this guy, Anil, Anil, uh, it's a double split experiment. He's got a whole book on the double split experiment. And um, I don't know if anyone here knows Steve Jervitson. I'm sure you know Steve. So Steve Jervitson, who's a, a venture capitalist, he's funded lots of interesting um, uh, companies, uh, including quantum uh, computation companies. Uh, he read the book and he, he, it convinced him that the only possible interpretation of quantum mechanics was the multi-universe interpretation because that particle has to go through one of those two slits, so it must go through both slits, so there must be two universes at every instance. And that seems to me to be a, 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 you know, a, 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 that level of explanation is um, getting so stuck in the metaphor that it drives how you think about things. He, you know, he's thinking about the particle as a thing. Well, what does a particle look like inside if it's a thing? Instead of thinking it as some sort of abstract algebra. So I think a lot of what we do in computation and in physics and in neuroscience is getting stuck in these, these, these metaphors. And by the way, the metaphors don't, aren't, aren't even real for computation. Uh, the, I, the, how many, how many, Danny, how many instructions do you think in a single x86 architecture, single core, how many instructions are running in parallel? Modern yeah, today. A dozen. 180. Uh, recent. 180 instructions are in flight at once. So a metaphor of computation is this is where the number is, this is this is you know where the control is, is completely a fiction that is built out of some much more complex metaphor. Um, so we don't even we, we use a computational metaphor. In, in a false way. Where, where the information is, how it's used is smeared out in time and space in some really complex way, which is why the, you know, the, the spectre uh, bug that's popped up is it's such a complex machine to simulate that metaphor for us that it, it breaks down. So I suspect that we are um, uh, uh, using this metaphor and getting things wrong as we think about neuroscience, as we think about how things operate in the world, I think it's possible that there are other metaphors we should be using and, 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 and maybe concentrating on. Because I think with our current computational thinking, we tend to um, end up doing our experiments and our simulations in unrealistic regimes where it's convenient for computation. We ramp up when we're doing a simulation, we ramp up uh, probability of events uh, so that we get something to happen. And in the real world, there's a lot of, there's, a, there's so many more instances of stuff happening out there, the probabilities can be much lower for the interesting stuff to happen. And so maybe we're operating in the wrong sort of regimes in thinking about things. Um, and we focus on local optimization in our computational experiments instead of global diversity. And we 
fairly simple dynamics in our computational spaces because that's what we can generate with, with computation. Um, so I think we fail to see commonalities across many different things. And, and I heard you talking, as I said, about genetic algorithms and the way that they couple together and sort of ratchet up in reality as distinct from our simulations. And there may be all sorts of, of little meta behaviors that we're not seeing that come together in some interesting way. So over time, we, in the, in the world of physics, you know, physical reality, we came up with computation or Turing came up with computation. It wasn't um, radical particularly. I think a, any good late 19th century mathematician could be taught the basis of computation fairly quickly, and they wouldn't they wouldn't be say they wouldn't say that's crazy. Whereas if you take a 19th century physicist and try to teach them either um, relativity or quantum theory, they're going to say, oh wait a minute, this is this is weird stuff. Computation wasn't wasn't weird stuff mathematically. It was pretty logical follow-on. In a sense, calculus wasn't weird stuff. Um, it was hard to come up with, but it wasn't weird stuff. So maybe there's other ways of thinking that are not weird, weird stuff, but we just haven't pulled them together yet, which will let us think about neuroscience, think about behavior in different ways, give us a different set of tools than we, than we currently have. I pointed in the note to John about a, a recent paper, could a neuroscientist understand a microprocessor? I, I talked about this years and years ago. I, I speculated that if you applied the ways neuroscientists work on brains with, with you know, probes and look at correlations between signals, and you applied that to a microprocessor and you didn't have a model of the microprocessor as how it works, it would be very hard to figure out how it works. And so there's a great paper in uh, PLOS last, last year where they took a... Uh, a 6502 uh, microprocessor running Donkey Kong and a few other games, and they did lesion studies on it. They put probes in. They found the uh, Donkey Kong transistors, which if you lesioned out 98 of the, of the 4,000 transistors, Donkey Kong failed, whereas different, different games didn't fail with those same transistors. So that was localizing Donkey Kongness in the 6502. But uh, a whole, they ran a whole lot of experiments just like uh, people run on neuroscience. And without an underlying model of what was going on internally, it came up with pretty much garbagey stuff that no computer scientist thinks is relevant to anything. It's, it's beyond, you know, breaking the abstraction. That's why I'm looking or wondering about where we can find new abstractions, not necessarily as crazy as... Um, or as different as quantum mechanics or, 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 or relativity is from normal physics, but are there different ways of thinking that are not, ex not, not extremely um, you know, mind-breaking that will enable us to do new things in the way that computation and calculus enable us to do new things. And when I look back at the early days of the Macy conferences, when I look back at the early days of computation, of AI, there was sort of a jump to classical computation based on this very simple version of the physical world is what must be explaining it all. And I'm, it's not clear to me that, that is serving us well. For a long time, we got stuck because Moore's Law was happening so quickly, no one could afford to... to uh, shift into different ways of thinking it. And Danny, I don't know whether you agree with me or not, but I think you know the connection machine uh, suffered from that. Moore's law was happening so quickly that when you came up with a new way of thinking about computation, you just got swamped by, by Moore's law. Even if you had a good idea, it didn't matter because you didn't have the resources of the you know, million people working on Moore's law classically in classical computers and you couldn't compete. So I think actually now, today, is sort of the golden age of computer art. You should go back to it, because now <laughs> everyone's looking for something new, even in classical computation, because Moore's law has stopped driving that craziness. So I, I, I see an explanation for why we got stuck in this cul-de-sac for so long, was Moore's law just kept feeding us, and we kept thinking, oh, we're making progress, we're making progress, we're making progress. But maybe we haven't been.
and I think I got him in under 20 minutes. 20 minutes and five seconds. <laughs> uh, question. Is, is this first talk of announcement of the death of computer science? <laughs> this is the chairman of the computer science department at it's MIT, the chairman of the AI lab at I, I MIT. Left, you know, but they, no, yeah. really, is this, is this a watershed? No, I don't think so. I don't think it's a watershed. Um, as I said this in a, in a 2001 paper in Nature. It made, didn't make a ripple. Um, but, but, I, but I think there's some, some questions for us to ask. But you may so want I, to disagree. I'm, I'm curious. You know, when you talk about computation, there are actually two ideas that became practice. One is the digital idea, and the other is the idea of universality. And the thing that wasn't clear at the time of Turing and so on was you know, how universal was the Turing? That wasn't clear probably until the 1980s. Or so. I'm not sure it's still clear. Well, physicists don't necessarily believe that it's universal. That, that depends on what the ultimate model of physics is. If the ultimate model of physics is something that can be run on a Turing machine, then it is universal in our universe. If it isn't, then it isn't. And I think we have a pretty good model for the physical world for practical purposes. The ultimate model might be quite different. Yeah. But practical purposes, which means anything you're likely to do in computation. But are you willing, we have the equation. Are you willing to give up calculus for computation? No, you don't have to. Right. And so, <laughs> so, so there can be up, and, 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 and yeah, part of that is because the complexity but of computation that, is very different from other physical but, processes. But, but, you know, one of the issues is there's a for discrete computation, there is this notion of universality. There is no similar notion that seems to be robust for continuous computation for continuous processes. That is, you know, Turing machine turned out to be, you know, lambda calculus, combinators, all these other things, turned out to be equivalent. You try and do the same thing with systems with continuous variables, there is no robust notion of universality. Well, there's a good one from Shannon, I mean, actually, which was, he came up with it during the same time as the early Macy conference. It's one of his less well-known but still great papers is about universal analog computers which basically says a proof that analog computers in the form made by Vannevar Bush back in the 1920s uh, with op amps and uh, program tunable inductors and resistors gears and capacitors and, gears and pulleys. could, could the, the, that such that these devices could simulate any set of nonlinear, linear or nonlinear ordinary differential equations. So there is some notion of universality for analog computation. By the way, I didn't, I didn't realize until I was reading up for this that Shannon was at the AI conference in Dartmouth. He was oh, he was at that 55 conference? Yeah, 56 is when... 56, yeah. yeah. Mm. Rod, I want to push further. You've thought about this for so many years. Everything you presented, I think we all agree. <coughs> but, but you actually didn't talk about the step after. No, I didn't give any answer. No. Yeah, so, so now that the talk is done, make an attempt. Mm -hmm. you, you've thought about this so long. Okay, okay. So um, when we look... And this is, this is sort of, in the, it's a mixture of the continuous stuff. It's sort of the, the big wide world, of lots of stuff happening simultaneously with local dynamics. And when you look at a particular process, and this happens in genetic algorithms, it happens in all, I've seen lots of examples of it in the artificial life field. Um, when you, when you, and, and, and you, you, you talked about a bunch of these in, in cellular automata. When you see a ratcheting process, of some sort, where things sort of ratchet up to, to order from disorder, something <coughs> that looks like mush, but out of it because of some local rules, order comes out. But it's, it's sort of limited order. But then when you put different pieces together, which locally do little pieces of order, <coughs> you, get, you sometimes get much more order from the coupling of them. And so what sort of calculus of that I'm thinking there may be something around that, a language for explaining how local little tiny pieces of water cross coupling across different places coupled together to get more water. That's the sort of thing. Is the think. picture each theorem and sorry? Is, is, is your picture each theorem like ma maximizing entropy? So, so it, in, in stat mac. Uh, 
there's sort of a, a messy, interesting, complex history about how local interactions end yeah. up maximizing entropy. Is, is, is that the well, metaphor? Well, 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 it's about order. You know, that tends to be a sign of irreversibility. If you have, you know, when you have something and it's flapping around all over the place, and you know, you want to organize it into a, a limited set of possibilities, that means there's irreversibility going on. The number of number of final states is smaller than the number of initial states. And, that, yeah. and that's, I mean, I don't think that phenomenon as such is that profound a phenomenon. You know, the, the question of what, um, or, um, yeah, I'm, I'm interested. What your response to what Rob was saying about the advent of <coughs> massive parallelism? Well, I, I don't think that was terribly profound. I think that was an engineering thing that was sort of inevitable in the world. And so that was a shift in the way that we built things. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I don't think it was the profound shift in thinking. Yeah, I was just saying it was a, it got buried. Even if it was a good idea, it got buried so, by that. So know. put yourself back at you know, at MIT, you're the chair of the computer. Do you have a computer science department now? What do you have? How do you, you know, how does this change? Well, it hasn't changed. I'm just, no, but how, I'm, just I'm trying to encourage people to. Uh, how would it, so, because um, it, it, so it, it speaks to what was going on with the basic conferences where things are moving and kind of you know, meta, meta program. Yeah, I, I, th I think that I think it should have um, it should have more influence on neuroscience in that I think neuroscientists have got so stuck on information theory as their metaphor that they're probably not seeing stuff that's going on. I'm, I'm worried about my my colleagues in brain and cognitive science. And, uh, uh, you know, and not being there, I can. I'd like the cognitive scientists here. Yeah. yeah. Australia. Um, I mean, I, well, one question I was going to ask is actually the extent to which you think that there are fundamental human cognitive limitations that are playing into that, right? So you made this distinction between, you know, weird stuff and not weird stuff, right? And the example that you gave of Steve Jobs and reaching that conclusion, that's a conclusion that makes a lot of sense based on what we know about human intuitions about causality which are that people expect causal relationships to be deterministic, right? And if you go in with that premise, then that's the interpretation you have to end up with. So I think there's an interesting question about what the what what are the consequences of you know human intuition trying to grapple with systems that defy human intuition and what the tools are that you can use to being able to get past that. And for something like quantum mechanics, the tools are math, where you know the mathematical system tells you how to do it, and you don't trust your intuition, and you run the math, and it tells you what the answer is. And I think, you know, I think I'm not sure that there's not going to be not weird stuff that'll. Yeah. So, 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 you know, the the, the more pessimistic version of what I said, is, you know, I think all of us here would be terribly surprised if we're at the beach and we saw a robot dolphin come out of the water that had been built by dolphins. We, we just don't expect the dolphins to have the cognitive capability to do what we're trying to do in artificial intelligence. We just don't think they have it. Um, nor the dexterity or anything. Well, we expect them to have better sense than to do such a thing. Yeah, yeah. But, but we, on the other hand, you know, neuroscientists or artificial intelligence people think, oh, we're going to be smart enough to overcome whatever limitations we have in the way we think about things in order to figure this stuff out. So the pessimistic view is, well, maybe, yeah. maybe we're stuck. I mean, in some ways, you can view deep learning as a as a as an example of a way that human intuition failed. And insofar as at the moment, the, like the, a lot of the advances that people are making in solving problems are the consequence of using these end-to-end -end systems, where instead of having a human engineer design the features and design the first stage of processing and then pass it off to a machine learning algorithm. You just build a system that goes straight from raw input to whatever you want as output, and then the system, given enough data, can do a better job of figuring out the right way of representing things to solve the problem. Um, and I think, yeah, in some ways, that's a bit of a rebuke to, <laughs> to our abilities as you know humans to intuit the right way of approaching certain kinds of problems. So, so one way of saying that is, when you talk about computer science, the question is, is there actually a science to computer science? That is, you have this neural net, and it's doing its thing, and you can see that it works. Can you talk about it in the way that sciences like to talk about things? And that's not yet clear. What about historians at the table? 
Well, maybe it's a kind of alchemy of an alchemy of binary. George, anything to say? No, just uh, the you know the Macy conference. Just to remind everybody, it actually started, and if my prejudice is, but with Julian Bigelow in 1943. And they wrote this paper, Behavior, Purpose, and Teleology. And that's, that was the paper that convened the first meeting. And it was exactly the same question that John opened up with here. So, so we're we're stuck. We haven't made it. I mean, I'm, 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 I would push against We're in a big loop, but we have better tools. So, I would so push against cool. the idea that we're stuck. I mean, in some sense, the very idea of computation itself is an example of a bunch of human beings, right, with human brains, overruling earlier sets of intuitions, overriding earlier sets of intuitions in ways that turned out to be very productive. So the intuition, you know, the intuition that, that centuries of philosophers and psychologists had had was that if you wanted something that was rational or intelligent, it was going to have to have subjective conscious phenomenology the way that, that people did. That was the whole theory of ideas historically. And then the great discovery was, wait a minute, this thing that is very subjective and phenomenological that the computers, the women who are computers are doing at Bletchley Park, we could actually turn that into a physical system. And that's terribly unintuitive, right? I mean, that's completely goes against, that completely goes against all the things, all the kind of intuitive dualism that we have a lot of evidence for. But the remarkable thing is that people didn't actually just seize up at that point, right? And they didn't even seize up in the way that that Thomas suggested where they said, okay, this is out there, or the way you might with quantum again, this is out there in the world, but we just don't have any way of dealing with it. People developed new conceptual, new conceptual intuitions and, and understandings that dealt with it. So the question is whether there's something that's like that that's out there now that could potentially give us those, could potentially give us that better metaphor. And I think it's important to say part of the reason why the computational metaphor was successful was because it was successful. I mean, it was incredibly predictive and for anyone who's actually trying to do psychology, um, you know, if you're actually trying to characterize, you know, what's going on in the head of this four-year-old, it turns out that thinking about it in computational terms is the most effective way of actually making good predictions. It's not a priori the case that it would have to, you'd have to think about it computationally. You could think about it as a dynamic system or you could think about it as an analog system. It's just that if you wanted to predict what the four-year-old did by thinking of it as an analog, thinking of them as an analog system, if, you know, if you were trying to predict things that were relatively high level, you'd just fail in a way that you wouldn't fail. But I'd love to hear your thoughts on Rod's second proposal, that it be the metaphor of adaptation. I mean, this is how I take your contribution. I mean, that adaptation right. is a different metaphor than computation. And I'd love to hear you examine how that is different from the computational model. Do you think it's different? I mean, that's a question, that's a question to ask. ask so, 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 first, I just want to respond to what you said. I agree completely with what you said. And I, I think an important thing, um, which even reading some you know, recent philosophy books, I, th I look at them and they argue in dualist positions. And they say, well, the, the, reason, you know, the way you're arguing against uh, 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 materialism in, in humanity says the computation can't work either. So to me, that it, it's been very powerful in, in, that, in, that, in that sense, besides being a model. But, it's a, but I, what I'm trying to say is perhaps it's only a model of certain aspects, and it, it's not everything, and there are other models for us to, to look for. I mean, and, and, and Carolyn, on this adaption, I don't, have a good, I don't have a good way of talking about it yet, uh, so I can't say how it applies. I think, I think it's an important difference. Yeah. The way we engineer our computational systems is with no adaptation, and the way all biological systems mm -hmm. work is through adaptation at every level, all the time. I mean, one of the one part of your talk and your, your thought, I take it to be a cautionary one. That is to say that there's this range of metaphorical domains, and we've you know. Dynamic systems, control systems, um, biological adaptation, resonance models, diff you know, different kinds of pictures. And of that panoply, we've chosen the computational almost uniquely to pursue. And that 
your warning. It's a kind of warning signal that maybe when we do that, we're limiting ourselves in, in, in certain ways and that there may be other ways that we might be able to make things work. Then it seems to me there's a, a second question, which is, what do we mean by work? You know, what, what, is, what is the goal? I mean, one question is, given the goal, what's the, what of these metaphorical domains are best mobilized to achieve that goal? And the second is, but a second question is, are there other goals that we might have? For instance, if the goal is prediction, then, then there's, you know, then we may look at the system and say, okay, well, computation does pretty well at a certain kind of prediction, whether it's end-to-end -end or something else. And then, but, it, but we might have other goals, unification or explanation or understanding or, you know, develop it or, you know, general, generalizability. It's, there, there are other goals that we might have. And I take it that that's something that might tie to some of what Stephen was referring to, like what do we mean by, by, a, by a science here? If we take science to be carved out by the predictive, then that may already predetermine how we value the different metaphorical precincts. I want to add one little thing, and I really want to hear what Dave says, but it's stimulated by, by what you just said, referring to, 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 to Stephen. You know, I think as computationalists, we live by building very concrete, concrete abstraction barriers, mm -hmm. uh, where there's a, a, the abstraction, the barrier is very tightly defined. And that's very different from what we see in biological systems, I think, where it's much more adaptive than, than the, the strictness that we see. But David was putting up his hand. Well, I think it's possible to, you know, I think computation is a broad church. It's possible to have an overly narrow conception of what computation comes to. I mean, the Turing machine, okay, it's, uh, it's, it's universal, but it also it stimulates certain ways of thinking about computation as classical computation, which is a very learned model. But I see the history of computation since, say, Turing as actually a progressive broadening that actually brings out the, uh, the power of the framework of computation. You know, for, you get to parallel computation, you get to uh, embodied computation, you get the move to uh, the quantum computation, you got the move to, uh, you start to keep out continuous computation. So I think of computation actually as a very, very broad church, and rather than thinking about, okay, let's overthrow some, you know, let's overthrow computation and replace it by something else, let's think about the relevant kinds of computation, in particular for the kinds of things you were pointing to, I thought, okay, well, let's think about adaptive computation. There's no contradiction between adaptation and computation. Um, I take it there are people thinking about adaptive computation at all levels, with um, you know, machine learning in some sense is adaptive computation. Okay, you want, maybe you want a more robust adaptive computation than that. But this, this doesn't, anyway, the, the project to me doesn't strike me as let's look at something to replace computation. No, I'm a fan of computation, let's look for the right kind of computation. Yeah, so let me, let, let me give you an example that I think fits your model there. You know, we went from the Turing machine to the RAM model, and current, still, um, computational complexity is really built on the RAM model of, of, of computation. Um, but you can imagine, and, and so it, it's, it's the, you know, how space and time trade off in, in, in computation. Well, one could imagine that um, uh, if the digital abstraction of machines had not been quite so perfect as it was in the 60s, that a different thing that could have become the principal thing was how quickly does a one-bit error propagate through computations and how bad can it get? And if that had been the, 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 the basis, maybe we'd have a totally uh, different, we'd be in a totally different world about hackability uh, because we'd have a completely different set of tools but still computational tools, but a, a different way of, 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 of what the metrics were and what was studied, and we would have a different computer science, even though we'd still call it computation. When you so, say neuroscientists are hung up on you know, information processing, well, I'd say, well, they're hung up on a certain very specific kind of information processing, maybe representational, um, using certain kinds of representational and information theoretical tools, but, you know, computation as a, as a framework is much, is much broader than that. But I get you got, you know... You could be a neuroscientist working with computation, working with algorithms, but hey, let's look at a different kind of kind of algorithm. I mean, is, is there anything which you're saying which is not going to be addressable by neuroscientists saying let's look at a different kind of algorithm? 
I think the main distinction you're making is about continuous versus discrete systems, which I'm not sure is a correct distinction either. No, and that's one distinction. I think it, it may be something some, somewhat different from that that we just haven't seen yet in the in the in the in the in the, in the large system of, of of lots and lots of processes happening without clear interfaces and, and lots of statistical stuff going on. And, and it's statistical just because you don't know anything. Um, there may be other sorts of structures there that we're not very good at. Well, one thing you mentioned implicitly, at least in the discussion of the worms, is the, that seems to me quite fundamental, is the question of openness versus closeness. The systems that have to have, take information from the world mm -hmm. instead of, have, of being programmed by somebody. That's a very fundamental distinction. And that also brings, it's close to the issue of analog versus digital. The real world has a much more analog aspect. And is also, how should I say, is, is uh, much less tractable. <laughs> we don't, it's, uh, so, so taking information from the real world and putting it into a machine we're learning may lead to structures that are much more complex and intractable than things that are programmed. Question, uh, uh, maybe to wrap this up, Freeman. Question. Yes. Uh, you're probably the only person here that was around before people talked about computing. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> there was a time. When did the, when did computing become a subject? Well, of course, it was a very active subject when I arrived in the States in 1947. Right. Von Neumann was already planning his machine and the ENIAC already was running. And so the, the computer age started five years before, so I wasn't involved in it. <laughs> but you observed. Um, Indeed. I mean, I was plunged into it, which was a huge luck for me. But, uh, you were married to a computer person, a computer, computerist? Yes. So I just was interested in your, what you had to say about rods. Yeah, but by, by, by the way, you know, I, uh, I didn't mention it, but von Neumann's book, which was published posthumously, yes, uh, Brains and Computers, brain. from a series yeah. of lectures yeah. he was working on. When you read that, it, it's actually, even though he was, you know, involved with Turing, it, it's sort of on the edge of Turingness in his conception of what a machine is. Well, he discussed in a very systematic way the choices he made in arriving at the von Neumann architecture and how it was quite different from a brain. He was very aware of this. Yeah, uh, I don't think he, I don't think he appreciated Turing very well. You should read the recommendation letter he wrote for Turing. For <laughs> <laughs> at the end of his life, he was also working on self-reproducing machines, which have right, a right, lot right. of the same aspect. Uh, right, right, some, right. some, You know, it's 29-state uh, automata yeah. self-reproducing. Which also is, is, you can call it computing, but it's not really computing. It's about taking things from the external world and making them from the well, They thought at that time that it was going to be very, the, this idea of universal computation was one thing, but then the idea of universal construction was yes, another thing. Yes, that's right. And that hasn't and really panned out. No, no, but maybe it's yet. <laughs> right. Yeah. Thank you. 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 Thank you.